morning. What a great day today, nice and sunny, but Christ is, should be our, our sun, our warmth, our comfort. And uh, I just want to read through Psalm 61.5, and I'll ask you to stand as I read this. <clears throat> Hear my cry, O, o, o God. Listen to my prayers. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Selah. For you, O oh God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. So we're going to try a uh, new song today called Cry Out to Jesus. I have no problems introducing new songs to this church because this church knows many more songs than we give it credit for. And so uh, sing along if you can, and I'm sure you'll pick it up very quickly. Someone they love long before it was their time. You feel like the days you had were not enough when you said goodbye. And to all other people with burdens and pains, keeping you back from your life. You believe that there's nothing and there is no one who can make it right. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, love for the broken heart. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing to meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus and cry out to Jesus for the marriage that's struggling just to hang on. They've lost all their life in love. They've done all they can to make it right again. Still, it's not enough. Of all the ones who can't break the addictions and chains You try to give up, come back again Just remember that you are not alone in your shame and your suffering There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary Love for the broken heart there is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing to meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus. When you're lonely and it feels like a 
whole world is falling on you. You just reach out, you just cry out to Jesus. You cry to Jesus and to the widow who struggles with being alone. Wiping the tears from her eyes For the children around the world Without a home Say a prayer tonight There is hope for the helpless Rest for the weary Love for the broken heart There is grace and forgiveness Mercy and healing Meet you wherever you are. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, love for the broken heart. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. Meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus. Cried Jesus. And we can cry out to him because Jesus is alive. He's risen. He's a living hope. And that's our next song. <clears throat>
that seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is a victory hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its trip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living home. Heavenly Father, we are so glad to declare this great truth in our midst. But you are the one who are in our midst. You're the very reason that we have these great truths to proclaim and to sing about. You have given us, dear God, this amazing gift of music by which we can emotionally and affectionately respond to you. Not empty emotions, dear God, but full of the truth of the gospel. With that in mind, Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would increase our confidence in the hope that we have because Christ indeed is alive. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would magnify his name now. In his name we humbly pray. Amen. Thank you, friends. Have your seats. Well, again, I add my voice to Steve's and welcome you this morning. We are very glad that we have the opportunity yet again to rejoice in the Lord. Thankful that God in his kindness has brought back Chester and Arianne and Skye safely. Uh, Chester in a month or so, but boy, you guys haven't been here for a long time, Skye. Two months, eh? Yeah, well, welcome home. We're glad some of you have been watching your journey on Facebook and that's been wonderful to see there, but uh, praise God you're back safely. Some of you know that we farewelled Miss Linda this past Thursday, and some of you were able to be there, which is wonderful, and those who were not able to be there, please know that on our church's website, you can see the funeral in its entirety. We were able to, uh, by the magic of technology, uh, be able to record that, and it's up there. So just go to our church website, the same place you see any of our other Sunday sermons, you can see it there. And, Again, by God's grace, uh, Miss Linda's eldest son, Clive, is with us again. Brother, we become fast friends. We just know each other well in just a few days, so glad you're here again, brother. And Clive had asked me to express to you folks how grateful he was for your presence at the funeral, for your prayers, and for your concern for his mom over the years. So glad to have you again amongst his brother. A few other updates for us, your friends. We are so thankful that as we had a long weekend last weekend and a good number of the folks put themselves out to be able to prepare food for us, it was a really encouraging time to enjoy fellowship again. So for all of you who sacrificed being up in the morning service and were downstairs caring for us by hospitality, we thank God for your gracious help. Next Sunday, we will have a church uh, members meeting immediately after the service, just a short meeting, less than 20 minutes probably, but it's an important meeting. Uh, we want to do this regularly to keep up to date with the congregation, but we have the blessing of bringing in Mary Ivanoff to church membership before her and David continue in their ministry. Uh, Emmy will give us a bit of an update on finances and the church's deacons and, and leadership will have an update for you. So again, immediately after church next Sunday, if you are a covenant partner here at Down you I encourage you to make some time in your schedule plan for that and please uh, plan to stay for that immediately afterwards again our church family 
which will be given an update on finances next week, as we say, has continued to be faithful in their giving. Uh, we continue to remind one another that God loves a cheerful giver more than God loves a generous giver. And yet, when you give cheerfully, then you will give generously unto the Lord. And you continue to do that. We thank God for that. You have the opportunity to uh, give through e-transfer or simply in the box at the back. But again, we want to just continue to express that we understand that our church ministry is funded by what you give. That's the only place the funds for our ministry come from. And we acknowledge God's kindness through you. Last week, we talked about our mission focus with one of our, our local church plants that we support, Liberty Grace. This week, I want to pray for a moment for a couple of our Feb Central churches that, as you know, we are part of the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches. That's what Feb stands for. We have 550-some churches across our country. Just about 300 of those churches are here in Ontario, and about 50 of them are actually here in Toronto. There's three main areas, leadership development, which helps pastors be placed and encouraged and developed in their uh, resources for ministry. Church health, which is something that helps churches on an ongoing way disciple one another and sometimes deal with difficulties. And then, of course, church planting, which is meaning we want people to know Christ well and we want to be able to make Christ known to others. And church planting is one of the real leaders, uh, leadings of our mission, in particular in the Toronto area where it's not always easy. So a couple of churches I'm going to bring to your mind and ask you to keep in prayer today. Uh, Living Hope Baptist Church, which is down on Lakeshore, almost Islington, and just about as far as you can go across uh, Lakeshore, actually a couple of blocks in there. Sam Aragonis is the new pastor there. He's uh, there for less than a month. Although he is a seasoned brother, uh, he actually worked alongside Ark when Ark had some work over at Rexdale Alliance Church in, uh, on Rexdale on Islington. And I mentioned Ark to Sam and he said, oh yes, I remember when he was involved with the youth. Sam was one of the associate pastors for 20 plus years at Rexdale Alliance, uh, began to have some convictions in terms of biblical fidelity and moved on, went to a very large nationally uh, sponsored church plant and realized that that was just not his calling. He really wanted to be with a intimate group of believers and God has called him then with almost 25 years of experience to Living Hope Church. Some of you would remember the name R.J. Unundup. R.J. used to be the pastor there. He serves as an elder along with me with Liberty Grace. R.J. is now a pastor out in uh, Guelph in a church called Crestwick Church. So Living Hope Church is not that far from us here. Pastor John Bell is a pastor at New City Baptist Church. This was a church plant through Feb Central, but actually directly through one of our sister churches, Grace uh, Church, Grace Fellowship Church in Rexdale. It was planted just about 12 years ago. Pastor John is there. They actually have not yet got their own building after so many years in Toronto. It's not easy to acquire a building with a faithful group of folks, but continue to keep John is such a fine, fine man of God, an encouragement to us in our Toronto Association of, of Pastors, as is Pastor Justin Galati. I know Grant knows Pastor Justin, and he had a great love for Downsview, and I remember him greeting me early on and said he was so thankful he knew Downsview, had been looking for someone for a while. So there's that connection with our Toronto churches and understand what's happening. He's a pastor of West Toronto Baptist Church, uh, Dundas, Dundas, is that right? Um, and they have been there for a good number of years. Justin has actually been at that church almost 15 years now and is a faithful servant of the Lord again. And our newest church, not only in Feb Toronto, not only in Feb Central, but the newest church to come into our fellowship across the country is called Grace Gospel Tamil Church. Tamil is the people group that are largely located in the country of Sri Lanka. You all know Akshaya. She's at her friend's wedding today, actually, but that's Akshaya's background, is, is Tamil. Pastor Manu has been the pastor there for literally 30 years. And they have just now come into our denomination because they started to see the value and the encouragement that there is in friendship and fellowship in the gospel. None of these four churches that I've mentioned to you, friends, are over 100 people. And that is overwhelmingly the average number of church in North America. The great big mega churches that we see, even churches 500 plus, are very much in the minority. Most churches look just like this. 
somewhere around 100, 150 people. And yet God continues to do his work and his kind, show his kindness that way. And particularly here in Toronto, where it is not easy to maintain uh, church plants. It's difficult to find properties, you can imagine. People are extraordinarily transient, in and out, and churches pay the price for that. But God is faithful, and God continues to use his people to do his work. And so let me ask you to pray with me to this end, please. Father in heaven, thank you for moving amongst us as a movement of churches here in Feb Central, particularly in Feb Central in the Toronto region. These 50-some churches that we have here, dear God, are a testament to your grace and your faithfulness. And so, dear God, we raise up before you today Living Hope Church. We raise up New Life and New City Baptist Church. We raise up West Toronto Baptist as well as Tamil Gospel Church. We're so grateful, dear God, that you have brought one another together in the gospel and in relationship and in effective ministry partnerships. We think even just last week as Redeemer Reformed Baptist Church came and served us in the worship team, that we've had so many other brothers come to our pulpit who are from our sister Feb churches. We're thankful, dear God, that there is actually a practical effectiveness of our ministry together. And I pray, dear God, especially today for Pastor Sam, Pastor John, Pastor Justin, and Pastor Manu, that you, Heavenly Father, would bring them great joy and confidence in your word, and it would continue to go out from their pulpits, and that the practical care for one another ministry and evangelistic efforts will be blessed by your hand. We pray, Heavenly Father, that it would be your kind intention to honor your Son in this way. We pray through Christ. Amen. We got some sad news this week, as you know, as we farewelled Miss Linda. Some of you I was asking to pray for our friends John and Anne. They are our neighbors at our campsite out in Waterloo, and Anne passed away unexpectedly and suddenly this past week. She was at the campfire Wednesday night, and she died Thursday morning. It's just how fast things change. And even as the funeral service for Miss Linda was wrapping up, uh, I got a notice from one of the folks who were there that a dear friend of Downsview Baptist Church, Danny Campbell, had passed away having uh, finished his fight with cancer for over the last number of years. Danny and Shireen are well loved by this church family. I just got to meet them as I was here before they moved to the Brampton area. And it wasn't but a year or so after Danny's retirement that the Lord struck him with his cancer and has now been pleased to call him home. So some of you I know know Danny and Shireen very well, Jarrell and Jada, their children, and we have been praying for them. I want to encourage you to continue to do that. I'm going to ask Errol to come and pray for the family in a moment, but there is some funeral information there, both on Thursday afternoon at the Brampton Funeral Home between 4 and 8. You can visit the family there. And then the following day on Friday morning at 11 o'clock, Hope Church, which used to be Hope Harvest Church in Mississauga, if you know them. Pastor Ted Duncan is the pastor there, part of our pastor's fellowship indeed. And he'll be uh, conducting the funeral there on Friday morning. So we rejoice with those who rejoice, and we should, and we should not feel guilty about feeling grateful and thankful for what God is doing when there are things to be joyful for. And then that divine mixture of knowing that God is, sees his own, the death of his own as precious in his sight, and yet death is never a good thing. Death may lead to a very good thing indeed for those who know Christ, but death itself is only in this world because of sin. That is never something to be celebrated or thanked God for. Only the result of it as he glorifies his name for eternity with those who are covered in his blood. Errol, would you come and give a word of prayer for the family, please? Oh. Morning. That picture of Danny that was taken in St. Kitts. I recognize that picture because of the banana leaf. Just a leaf from a banana tree, okay? <laughs> uh, I know Danny just before he started university when I began at his church. He was a teenager. 
I was young then myself. And uh, we just uh, become a very good friend. And uh, he and my son, he always speak on Amar. We call him, uh, we call him Amar Earl Jr. He always speak on him. And um, he, they always try to chase his father around. My kids grew up in this church. And uh, when pastor talking about Danny's, you know, I just started to feel all this grief or sorrow. Uh, could you stand with me, please? <clears throat> Father, only you know why you have taken Danny away from us so soon. And uh, people of the world may want to know how come he's a Christian and he dies so young. But Lord, you have the answer to all these questions. Father, we leave Shireen. Jurel, Jada, Wendy's sister and her family, and Laura, the nephews, Jack and Rose, we leave them in your hands as they grieve this moment, the passing of their son, Danny, and the passing of their husband, Shagin's husband, and the kid's father and uncle. Lord, we ask you just to comfort them in this time of grief because there's no easy way to say goodbye, especially to someone you love. So Father, you comfort them. Let them know that they can lean on your shoulder. And as we as church family grief is passing, just give us comfort in our hearts also. Father, you take charge now, I pray. In your name I ask it. Amen. Have you remain standing as we sing Jesus Paid It All? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me that all and all Jesus paid it all All to him I owe The sin that left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's fall And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all All to him I own Sin that left the crimson stain He washed it white as snow And when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life. 
truth of this song. We owe him everything. And yet, we can be happy and rejoice because Christ is risen. Christ is alive. And that's our next song. grace, how sweet the sound to save the wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Prodigal is welcomed home, the sinner now a saint. For the God who died came back to life, now everything is changed. Hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. Death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? For the mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours. Oh, praise his name forever. Christ is risen from the grave, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave, and all throughout eternity, a song will be the same, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. On the day you call me home to heaven's sweet embrace, I'll see your cars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. And through the tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah! Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? For the mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours. Oh, praise his name forever. Hallelujah, Christ 
is risen from the grave and all throughout eternity a song will be the same hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave amen you may be seated we have the children come forward please and we'll pray for them I would say the children, the children and their teachers. <laughs> Friends, would you pray with me, please? Dear God, you know these young lives that are here and that are coming to be taught your beautiful and eternally effective word. We pray for that effect today, dear God, to be the hallowing of the name of Christ. We say with Jesus, as he taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We pray, dear God, that that hallowing will be helped to happen among these children today. Bless Tatiana and Diana. I pray, dear God, as they seek to bring a lesson that will bring the power of your word to bear upon these young lives. That you, Heavenly Father, will continue to do that work until each one has set their hope in God. In Christ we pray. I invite you at this time to take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Numbers. Today will be in Numbers chapter 9, beginning at verse 15 to verse 23. If you do use those Bibles in the pew, the regular size print is on page 118 and the slightly larger print is on page 138. We started a few weeks ago, this is our fourth time we are in the book of Numbers seeking to encounter our Lord Jesus Christ through these pages as they point us forward to the New Testament scriptures and how we are called directly to live and breathe and honor our Lord even in our day. The book of Numbers is named for Numbers, as many of you would know, that there was a census in the very first chapter of the book and the very last chapter of the book. The beginning census was all of those who left Egypt. The second sentence, census, or numbering of the people, was done just before they moved into the promised land, where, as you know, so many, 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 because of their disobedience, after 40 years, had died in the wilderness. In the wilderness, or in the desert, is another name for this book. It takes place between the people of God leaving Egypt, about halfway through the book of Exodus, and ends, essentially, on the banks of the Jordan River, before they move right in to the promised land. So it basically takes you through the half of the book of Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and into Deuteronomy. And so we have often neglected some of these Old Testament books with really boring names, like Numbers. This is often where people get bogged down in their yearly read through the Bible. It's like, oh my goodness, I have to keep reading these numbers. The fact is, brothers and sisters, you, I'm sure, like me, have been convicted, as some of you have been reading through this book in preparation for this series, how amazingly Christ-centered this book is. The incredible way that it points us forward to our Lord Jesus Christ and how he is magnified and might be magnified by our obedience and our honoring of him. So, Numbers, Numbers chapter 9, can I ask you to stand with me in respect as we read God's word? Numbers chapter 9, beginning at verse 15. After the Passover has just been given, they've been given instructions about how to uh, keep and honor the Lord through the Passover meal. We read in chapter 9 and verse 15. On the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle. And let me pause for a moment. The tabernacle was church. You think of it that way. This is a place where God met with Moses and Aaron. It was a prefiguring of the temple that would come. And when you see it saying the tent of the testimony, that is another name for the tabernacle. This is where they met God, essentially. So on the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. 
And at evening, it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. And so it was always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after that, the people of Israel set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out, and at the command of the Lord, they camped. Now, as long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they remained in camp. Then, according to the command of the Lord, they set out. Sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning. And when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and the night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a longer time that the cloud continued over the tabernacle abiding there, the people of Israel remained in camp and did not set out. But when it lifted, they set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped. At the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. So far, the reading of God's word. Please have your seats. <laughs> Some of you are trying to hold back a chuckle as you say, if they camped and then they went, and if the cloud stayed, they stayed, and then if the cloud stayed for a few days, sometimes it was for a week, and you're going, no wonder people get bogged down in these readings, right? It's just repetitive and repetitive. Just tell us once, God, we got it. Anybody feel like God only has to tell you something once for you to get it? Anybody brave enough to think that? <laughs> of course not. God knows that we have to hear it more than once, that we forget that we forget my neglect and we forget just by our own capacities. God in his mercy tells us again and again. And when you find repetition throughout the scriptures, you must hear the urgency, the emphasis of the Lord saying, this matters, you've got to get this. Please understand precisely what I'm saying to you. One Bible commentator says, when God repeats himself, he is requiring of us scrupulous obedience that's the goal in the fine points not just glossing over that the word of god would not be something that merely influences or seasons or makes a slight impact into our lives it must do that but it must govern our lives the word of god is in control of the people of god amen that's our goal that's our goal that's what we're striving for as we walk through this book of Numbers today, again, seeking to encounter our Lord Jesus Christ, as we're seeing some of these themes, it's relatively clear what the outline is to this passage, isn't it? What should we do in light of this passage? Number one, we should expect the Lord to lead us. There should be an anticipation that the Lord will lead you. Because of that anticipation, there must be a looking to the Lord to lead us. Expect him to lead us, look to him to lead us, and therefore believe that his leading is the best. That the Lord does not leave us to ourselves, merely in expectation and looking, but that he leads us the best way to the best places in the best timing, repeating himself all along so that we get it. And so, what do you see in this text? Well, the first part we see here is, again, expect the Lord to lead you. I wonder if that's something you've come in here this morning expecting to happen. As you hear the hallelujah, Christ is risen from the dead, 
And throughout, throughout all eternity, our song will be the same. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the dead. Or are we expecting that the Lord is going to lead us into a deeper understanding of what heaven's going to be like? Of what Mary, both Miss Linda and what, what Danny and so many others are, are, are enjoying today and have been enjoying from the other side of their last breath. God is leading us into truths like that. I mean, did I know that many of us have gone to the Lord in prayer over the years? Said, Lord, I've got a pretty major decision here and I'm not sure what to do. And you look for chapter and verse and it doesn't have the name of your potential wife in there, does it? Well, maybe it does. <laughs> You look in the scriptures and you say, Lord, it doesn't seem to say if I'm supposed to take the job at Rogers or, or Shaw. I mean, I, I don't know what, what Lord, how, how do I know if I'm supposed to move from Sault Ste. Marie to Toronto? There doesn't seem to be a chapter and verse for this. How do, how do I know, Lord, I want you to lead me. What do I do? And there simply comes, dear friends, a, a time in our Christian lives that we have to understand that if we are indeed Christians, which simply means followers of Christ, that if we are going to actually be followers, someone's got to lead. It's got to be someone blazing the trail in front of us. And part of our very basic, basic DNA as Christians is we expect the Lord to lead us through this life. Right? Show me, Lord. Lead me, O thou great Jehovah. Gentle shepherd, lead me. Lead me through this life. And there needs to be, as the people of God showed, an expectation that God would lead them. Whenever the cloud lifted over the tent, they set out. Whenever the cloud settled, they camped. Frankly, after a while, as you see it rep being rep repetitive, they expect God to be moving. They expect God to be leading them. And you notice the parallels there? At the command of the Lord, they set out. At the command of the Lord, they can. And you're reading going, where does God command it? God didn't say anything. I'm looking for a command. Move. And the Lord spoke to Israel. Get up and go three miles to the... He didn't say that. He does it by a personification, if you will, or at least a symbol of his very presence in this cloud and the fire. Throughout the day and throughout the night... An assurance that he's with them. An assurance that the leading is going to continue. That God has not let them go. And it builds an expectation that as God calls us to move, we will move. As God calls us to stop and to wait, we will wait. Oh boy, that sounds about as elementary as you need to teach a Sunday school class, isn't it? Come on, Pete, of course. If God says go, we'll go. If God says don't go, we won't go. Again... Anyone brave enough to say that's how it always works? God just has to tell me something to do it and I'll do it. No. God just has to tell me to wait and I'm happy to wait. Man alive, patience is not our number one mode of operation, is it? And yet, brothers and sisters, what we are trying to encourage in ourselves by a simple text like this is that we as the people of God at Downsview Baptist Church will be those who expect the Lord to lead us. You see, being led of the Lord actually begins with an expectation that he will do so. You're not taking the Lord for granted. You're not putting on him something he doesn't want put on him. To be led of the Lord, the lead me, gentle shepherd, lead me through this world. The expectation is what's required in order for that to happen. So you expect the Lord to lead you, but you notice then we have to look for it. Sometimes you might say we have to listen for it, but in the text it's just not listening, it's just looking. Expect the Lord to lead you and look to the Lord for that leading in verse 20. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle and they, according to the command of the Lord, remained in camp. Sometimes the cloud continued over the tabernacle, abiding or remaining there, when, they did, when it did, the people of Israel remained there. They remained in camp. Pretty simple. How do they know the cloud is remaining over the tabernacle? They've got to look. They've got to be aware. They've got to be interested. Their expectation leads to action. 
I expect you to lead me. Now I'm looking to see how do you lead me, Lord? In this case, it was specifically with this cloud and with this fire. So there needs to be something within us, brothers and sisters, as rudimentary as it may sound to you, to when you say to yourself, Lord, I, I don't know what to do. How am I supposed to get, get through this life? What's next? We should say to each other, well, have you, have you looked to the Lord? Funny how we have that phrase, look to the Lord in prayer. We said that, don't we? I think I speak to the Lord in prayer. I listen to the Lord, but I'm, what am I looking for? Well, it's, it's, what we're, it's an idea that our attention and our focus is moving towards the Lord, that we might move towards Him. We're looking to the Lord for direction because that's what we expect Him to do. You see, being led of the Lord is in fact a call for us to seek His leading. We're very good at praying prayers like, God, this is my plan. Would you please bless it? Or frustrations that say, Lord, you know what I prayed for, which being translated means, you know what my plan was. It doesn't seem like you're interested in doing what I've asked you to do. Friends, being led of the Lord begins again with not only just an expectation of it, but a recognition that being led, wanting to be led by the Lord means a, a call for us, implies a call for us to seek that very thing. To ask him through his revealed word what he would have me to do. You've heard us say many times, I don't know what God's will is for my life. I say, well, start here. Have you tried this? If you've done all this, then come back to us. <laughs> right? God has been pleased to show himself all things we require for life and godliness. When Peter wrote that to the people, that was a circulated letter. He's saying we should have every expectation that God really does reveal what we need from him in his word. Now part of that revelation is the revelation that he will give us his Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. But that leading into all truth always begins with the leading by the truth. To be guided and move in scrupulous obedience to what his word is calling us to do. And then for the very specific things that we need God's help and God's leading in, we simply pray that he would be pleased to move. Move us towards the goal that he has for us. These folks in Israel had to look to the cloud to know where they were supposed to move. We must look. The simple question of application, as rudimentary as it sounds, is are you anticipating his lead without looking for it? Do you have an expectation that God will lead without you looking? Now, to be sure, God is not hemmed in by our lack of looking in order for him to move in our lives. But there's every expectation here that the people of Israel went, all right, we're not taking one step forward until the Lord leads us. We expect him to do it. We look to him to do it. We honor him in looking him to do, to do that. We say we will indeed follow and we will follow where you lead us. Jesus in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 3, has left us an example that we might follow in his steps. That he has blazed a trail for us. That we as his followers are the ones who are following our Lord in obedience. And we are seeking him to do that. But our third point, which is slightly longer, is that in the text here, there's an expectation of God's blessing. There's a looking to God for his blessing and his leading. But there needs to be a belief that the Lord leads best. This is where we, just as the people of Israel constantly get it wrong, constantly get mixed up, and are constantly falling short of God's design for us. The text in chapter 9 and verse 23 says, the command of the Lord, or at the command of the Lord they camped. At the command of the Lord they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. They, got, they were charged with moving only when he called them to. They were charged with following him. Only when he called them to do that. And for a time, at times, throughout this book, 
throughout the history of this nation, just like at times and throughout the history of your life and mine, we actually do keep the charge of the Lord. We actually do it because we believe that his leading really is the best. And yet, it's not difficult to see the troubles. Because that simple question, what is required for us to expect and look to the Lord for leading, what is required is a trust in the Lord. To trust that he knows what is best, that he knows where to go, that his power is powerful enough to take us there, that his wisdom is, is enough to guide us there, that his love is consistent enough that he won't let us go on the way, that we require trust in the Lord, that we require to believe him when he speaks, not just believe in him generically, we believe him when he speaks. It requires faith. And we will be reminded in Hebrews chapter 11 that faith is required in order for us to follow Jesus. And without such faith, it's impossible to please God. Pleasing God is something that happens when we trust, when we believe, when he speaks, when we have faith in him. God's pleasure comes in the form of us following his lead. And without belief in him, we can't please him to that end. Brothers and sisters, you and I will only follow him if you believe that he has the best for you. Do you realize that? I'm over with our young granddaughter. Yesterday, Pam and I were, we call it babysitting. We're just having a ball with little Glory. And it was supper time. And I say, Glory, we're going to have some of this food here. And I said, what, what would you like for supper? Chicken nuggets? She's learned chicken nuggets. <laughs> and he we said, well, Oma says we need to have some, some, some tomatoes and some strawberries and some blueberries. And Glory likes all those things. But now she's got chicken nuggets in mind. And when I say, you need to eat this, and she says no, why did she say no? Because she doesn't believe that Papa has what's best for her. And then when Papa gets the chicken nuggets out, which is what we do to spoil our grandkids, we didn't actually do it yesterday, but we certainly do it. When he gets that out, oh, now I'll follow you, Papa, because now I believe that what I want is what you want. And the best thing for me is what I think is best for me. That's not just my little granddaughter who does that. We're all, as R.C. Sproul says, just grown up kids, right? We only follow Jesus if we believe that he knows what's best for us. Which is why we, like the people of Israel, get so mixed up. Every act of disobedience is a failure to believe that Jesus knows what's best. That's what sin is. Sin is a failure to trust Jesus that he knows better than I. And you and I will only follow him if we believe that seeking his pleasure is the best thing for us. And you know that he is pleased when we obey him. That's what faith does. That's how faith acts. Faith moves us towards the Savior. And so every act of disobedience is a failure to seek his pleasure over my preference. That's what sin does. It seeks my, pre my preference over the pleasure of God in my life. And what was, again, the key problem of the people in the wilderness? They were sure they knew best. Sometimes they kept the charge of the Lord, as you know. But they were sure that they not only knew better, they knew better than the Lord. The priority, as is so often my priority, their own pleasure. What happened back in chapter 14 is just a few chapters ahead. See that in Numbers 14? That night the members of the community raised their voices, wept aloud. And what? They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Why were they grumbling? What did they know better? If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land? 
only to let us fall by the sword. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Do you see what happened? Look how fast. I don't have the pleasure of God in mind. I'm not willing to let him lead. So I start to think about my own preferences, what is ultimately my pleasure. And look at the foresight I have. Look what's going to happen if we stay out here. They're going to fall by the sword. Our wives and children will become as plunder. How do they possibly know that? Do you see what fear does? Fear invents fantasies and calls us to live in the middle of it and be anxious and worried. And people from the outside go, what are you worried about? Well, this and this and this is going to happen. And we say, how do you know? How would you, how would you possibly know what's going to happen? Especially in the path of obedience. If we do that, people are going to say, if we do that, people are going to do, you know what's going to happen, or I've heard about it happening, or someone told me it's going to happen, or I read in a book, it happened before. It's amazing what giving in to our own preference over the pleasure of God will do for us. Wouldn't it be better? See how they think they know better? Wouldn't it be better to just go back to Egypt? In fact, they said to each other, let's choose a leader who'll take us back to Egypt. Who's leading them through the desert? Not Moses. God is leading them through Moses. And what do they say? Let's choose a leader who will take us back. What are they saying? Choose a leader who will lead us where we want to go. Not this dummy who's got us out here in the wilderness. Not this dummy who's leading us. You think that's exactly where they end up in no time. Their simple choice and their problem and mine is they chose not to follow their leader. God was leading them. They said, we want another leader. And like Israel, we are always so sure of our own leadership in our own lives. And God speaks to Moses about them in chapter 14 and verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? What do you think they would have said? We don't despise you. We don't hate you. We don't even care enough about you to hate you. You know you have to be deeply involved, relationally engaged with someone to actually hate them? It takes a lot of work to be mad at someone for an extended period of time. They'd say, we don't despise you. We are not interested in you. Leave us alone. Let us go where we want. God says they hate me. That's what it means. How long will they not believe? How will they not believe in me despite all I've done for them? Now don't hear God whining there. Because it sounds like us when we whine when people let us down, right? I've done and I've done and I've done and they don't care. That's our grumbling. God is just declaring the fact that when he does, it ought to make a difference to our trust and our relationship with him. That's what's happening. Instead of it making a, a difference in our confidence growing in him, and if you love me, you will keep my commands, our love growing for him. Instead of that, we like Israel are on the cusp of despising God. Yeah. Even Aaron and Moses, who at this time are the champions of the Lord. And by chapter 20, Moses is whacking that rock so that it will pour out water. Looks like everything's good. And the Lord said to Moses, because, and Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me. You did not uphold me as holy. You're not taking the people into the promised land. You, Moses, just like all those other disobedient folks that came out of Canaan, apart from Caleb and Joshua, they're all going to die in the desert, including you now, Moses. Because what? You did not exercise faith in my pleasure in your life. You are determined. You knew better than me. And brothers and sisters, when we think we're the smartest guy in the room rather than Jesus, we fall into exactly the same trouble, don't we? They would not, they did not, they would not believe that God was leading them in the best way. Frankly, with most of them, God was not pleased. God takes a sense of expectation and looking to him seriously. 
And we must believe that he knows the best way so that our expectations and our looking will come to pass. Elsewise, God's pleasure will not be upon us. And it is a horrible fate that awaits us. And yet, time and time again, from the time of the Israelites in the book of Numbers till this morning in Downsview neighborhood, God has been pleased to break in in grace. This is where we get to Jesus, friends. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Can I encourage you to turn there, please? Look forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Page 957. Or page 1137. 1137. The Apostle Paul writing to this church that was very young and very immature and did not know better yet. So Paul wants to save them from some of the difficulties that his ancestors according to the flesh knew. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1, what does Paul say? I want you to be aware, brothers. He calls them brothers. They're immature, they're mixed up, but they're Jesus people. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. Do you see the straight line from Numbers 9 to 1 Corinthians 10? Our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. It's exactly what's being spoken about here. We drop down to verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Those who sought to direct their own lives apart from the revelation of God. As personally as look to the cloud when it moves, I'll move. When it stops, I'll stop. What could be simpler? What could be less complicated? What could take no detailed Bible exposition or interpretation? Here, there. Go, stop, just do as I'm showing you. Show me that you love me by obeying me. And with most of them, God was not pleased. Now these things, how does that apply to us? Verse 6, now these things that we're spoken of back in Numbers chapter 9 took place as examples for us. Wonderful. When the New Testament interprets the Old that directionally for us, those things happen as examples for us. Now I know what that's there for. For my example, for me to take a picture of and a pattern, what kind of pattern, Lord, that we might not desire evil as they did. Oh. Do you see the new category we have? Unbelief is not just failure to follow, it is evil. Paneros, it's a Greek word that means the evil one. It is inspired by the very prince of darkness, if you will, the father of lies, the deceiver of the brethren. This happened as an example that we would not fall like they did, is what he's saying. And refusing, therefore, brothers and sisters, the Lord's leading is evil, the Apostle Paul says. I know this is weighty, friends. But go ahead, feel the weight of it, safe in the arms of Jesus, because that's who's being spoken to. He's saying, these things happen an example for us, so we would not fall like they fell. Refusing the Lord's leading is not only evil, it's actually hatred of God. you remember how he said that in chapter 14? You don't think that any more than I do. In the moment of ignoring God's call upon our lives, in pushing aside his revelation of himself, we don't think we're hating God. The Bible says it is precisely what we are doing, despising hatred towards God. And yet what therefore is the instruction of their example? Well, don't do what they did, but there, there's more to it than that, isn't there? Drop down to verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10. Because for the second time, he says, now these things happen to them as an example. 
To whom? They were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come, for us. It's not the only reason. It's not what Paul's saying. There had no application to others, but he's saying specifically to us upon whom the end of the ages. It's a theological term from the time of Jesus' uh, ascension till his second coming. That's the end of the age. That's the last age, if you will. That's where we're living. Just like it looks like we're living in the time in the book of Numbers, we are explicitly living in these ages that are to come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Did anyone not know that was the next verse? Come on, you didn't know. Did you know really? <laughs> I looked at, that's the context of that verse. Grant and I talk about this verse all the time. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest you fall. No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful that with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape. You're not going to be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, you will provide or he will provide a way of escape so you can endure it. That verse is so often just out there on its own. Oh, it's in the flow of the instructions of the evil desires of the people of God that caused most of them to perish in the desert. What's Paul saying? I don't want it to happen to you. It need not happen to you. This is a parent to their children looking back on our horrible, godless lives at times, saying, son, daughter, don't make the mistakes that I did. Don't let my bad example cause you to follow that example. Do better than this. It doesn't have to happen to you. The Apostle Paul is saying, listen, God provides in the midst of our protest. That's the extraordinary thing that's about to happen here. That's what's happening in the midst of this text. God says he provides a way of escape in the midst of the temptation to lead your own life rather than follow the leader. He provides a way of escape. That's not the same as saying we provide or figure out a way out. God does. See the mercy that's being pointed to now? The mercy that's being poured out? The undeserved kindness of the Lord. How incredibly gracious and generous he is. I, I find myself in a temptation, which God does not tempt people, the book of James says. He does not cause people to be tempted. When I'm tempted, I'm drawn away by my own lusts. So when I find temptation in the world, what's he saying? Well, number one, you're not the only one to face it. No temptation has seized you except that which is common. I'm the only one, I, I alone am left, the Elijah syndrome. No, no, you're not. You're not the only one who's faced this. You might be a, one of the few. You might be the only one you've ever known. But you're not the only one. The temptation that is seizing you is common to other people. And yet what is also common is the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. He doesn't mean your intrinsic ability. He means the ability that he gives you. The ability he's going to give you is what? That he's going to provide a way out that you can take. He's going to provide an exit door that you can get out of this temptation. You need not fall. Our obedience is always a response to God's provision, not the cause of it. God provides the way of escape, not us. Perhaps Robert Frost was on to something in one of his poems that the best way out is always through the difficulty. I don't know if Mr. Frost was reading Psalm 23 or not, but you know the psalm. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, why will I fear no evil? Because your rod, protection, and your staff will guide me, is with me. But what does he say? Though I walk around the valley, right? Just get around it. Avoid it. Through it, through that God will provide a way of escape that you may endure it, through it, that you may come through it by the grace of God. 
He will provide it. How kind of God not to just leave us. When he says it doesn't happen to you, he doesn't just instruct us, he actually leads us the right direction, away from this temptation, away from destruction. Because that's how faithful our God is, friends. That's how God is faithful to his word and his promises and his character displayed in those promises. And make sure that although we, like Moses, do not always uphold him as holy, he makes sure that his name will be hallowed in this earth. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The Lord of for the fortress, the Lord of, of armies is our fortress. Because my name will be exalted in the earth, God says in Psalm 46. My name will be exalted throughout the people of this world. And what is this way of escape? What is this ultimate way of escape? This is an extraordinary verse. That Jesus was that rock. Chapter 10, verse 4, look what he says. <laughs> they all drank the same spiritual, or they all eat the same spiritual food in verse 3. And they drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Are you kidding me? In the desert of Sinai, Jesus was with them. Personified, if you like, but a pre-incarnate Lord Jesus with his people. Moses smacked the rock over disobedience. God provides for his people because God is just that faithful. Our obedience does not cause his provision. And many times our disobedience he provides anyway. He won't let us go. He doesn't leave us to the consequences of our own sin. He is not a lazy parent who lets his children run out in front of the street and go, Oh, well, do whatever you want. I told you not to. No, no, he grips us by the hand and keeps us close to him. He does not let us go. That's how faithful God is. And the ultimate way of escape is through the shed blood of our king, who is the ultimate provision. Jesus was that rock. God provides just that directly for you this morning. For you, you, like me, who have not followed our leader, who believe we know better, who choose our preference over his pleasure, our God comes in provision of the shed blood of our king. That's what the gospel is. God providing for us what we desperately need and they're not even asking for. And even if we ask for it, we're not worthy of receiving it. No, God comes in grace and provides what we as his people need. Lead me to the cross where your blood poured out. We pray that and God leads us there. The ultimate provision in Christ. And so brothers and sisters, we must expect God to lead us. We must look to God to lead us and we must believe that God leads the best because at the end of the day brothers and sisters believing that the Lord leads best is precisely the message of the gospel that's the good news this is the one who will lead us beside still waters and green pastures hallelujah let's pray father how kind of you to again show us yourself in grace thank you for the power of your word to placard your glory for us. Like a billboard, we look and we see, dear God, how wonderfully gracious you are to us, undeserved to be sure. I pray, dear God, you'd remind my heart today of your past provision that ought to inform my faith for the future. Kill the fear, dear God, that rises up and threatens to destroy us. Remind us, Heavenly Father, that you direct and are involved in our lives as precisely as a cloud over our homes, a fire over our homes. You move just that intentionally. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that it would be your intention to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to feel, to care to seek to live lives that are honoring to you. We pray that, even as we sing, in Christ's name.
Amen. I'll ask you to stand with me as we sing our closing song. That Christ is enough. That's a question I want you to ask yourself as we sing through this song. Was, was Christ enough to fulfill the law? Was Christ enough to pay our debt? Is Christ enough to provide for us? And by believing in him, by believing he's enough, we can choose to follow him. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion and now there's nothing in this world I could ever satisfy and through every trial my soul will sing no turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me Everything I need Everything I need, Christ, my all and all, my joy and my salvation, and this hope will never fail. Heaven is our home through. Every storm, my soul will sing. Jesus is here. To God be the glory. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back The cross before me The world behind me No turning back No turning back The cross before me The world behind me No turning back No turning back Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me everything I need is in you everything I need I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back the cross before me the world 
behind me no turning back no turning back the cross before me the world behind me no turning back no turning back Perhaps God is moved by his spirit this morning and you want to decide to follow Jesus today. We would love to pray with you to that end. We would love for you to recommit yourself to the decision to follow Jesus that perhaps he moved you to make a long time ago. By God's grace, we are prayerful that he will draw his people to himself and that they would know the deep pleasure that there is in knowing his satisfaction and his sufficiency. Let's pray to that end. And if you'd like to, we'll be a couple of us on the front pew. We'd be happy to pray with you afterwards. Let's pray together now. Father, for all our needs, there is grace. For all our needs, there is sufficient grace. Dear God, there's sufficient grace because there's a sufficient giver of grace. But it's given because of your kindness as our Savior. It's given, dear God, because you magnify yourself in being the fountain of all good, refreshing water. Mm. You, Heavenly Father, have been pleased to send your Son to take my place. And having lived the life that I should have lived, He went to the cross and was treated as one who had lived my life to take on the just punishment for my sins so that I might not have to endure it. And dear God, with that confident promise in mind that you will never leave us or forsake us as we surrender ourselves to you, I pray, dear God, that you would move by your spirit to cause others in this room because of your gift of faith to be sure, but to simply decide to follow the leader today. He is our king. He is the sovereign. He is the creator, sustainer, and judge of the universe. And he bids us to come without cost, to come and to eat and to drink without cost, since Christ has paid it entirely. And so as we have decided to follow Jesus, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would encourage our hearts with the certainty that the only thing that death can do for your people is to make their lives infinitely better. Mm. I thank you for that confidence in Miss Linda's case. I pray you will fill Shireen and her family's heart with that confident hope today. Pray, dear God, for those who have gone on before us who know Christ. As we look forward one day to the triumph, the triumph in heaven. And I pray that that certainty, dear God, would cause us to lay down our lives now sacrificially with joy and know the sacrifice, the joy that there is from sacrifice. To know that displaying our God as holy because we believe in him. We pray, dear God, that we'd find our sufficient satisfaction in you to the glory of your great son's name we pray now in christ amen you're dismissed friends